breath in our lungs, you have given us minds to think. I thank you, God, for everything that you have protected us from today that we have not known. I thank you for your mercy, which endure always, Lord. We thank you for your son who you sent to die for our sins, to um, intercede on our behalf for the things that we have done today that we may not even know. Lord, we pray that you will lead the service, that your spirit will guide us and lead us and fill us with grace and humility in our hearts to worship you in truth and in holiness. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 <coughs> I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be, be and quicken from the dead. I gave
First Peter. First Peter, we are carrying the book of First Peter, and we, we thank God for his word. Uh, I pray that you open to your the, 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 the first Peter so we can go right through it. Uh, after that, uh, Mamadora will come and 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 uh, extend greetings to you and let you know what we have the rest of the week. First Peter chapter one. Are you there yet? If you are there. So, let, uh, amen, I can hear amen, I can see, I want to see those of you on YouTube watching, wave the Bible, I can see your Bible to the, on YouTube too. Anyway, God bless you. Well, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the knowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. You know, look at all that it takes, the qualification that uh, Peter is talking about here. Now let's uh, start again. He said Peter, and then he says he's an apostle of Jesus. Peter is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He did not make himself apostle, but he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he's writing to the strangers scattered throughout. Who are the strangers? The, maybe the Jewish uh, Jews who have been scattered all over. And believers also, all over. Because at this point, Gentiles have also been, I mean, co-opted into, into sainthood. They are all believers. So we are talking about Christians scattered all over. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And they are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So my beloved, you, those of us listening, all nations, family, and everyone who has joined us, if you are a believer, you have been elected according to the foreknowledge of God. You didn't come to know the Lord by chance. You didn't know, come to know him by accident. You have been elected. God foreknew even before you were born. He knew that at this point, you will give your life to him. So you are elect, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification. When you say sanctification, being set apart, being set apart, that is why it is important that we who identify with Christ uh, be set what? apart. In fact, this morning's message that the Lord gave me to deliver on YouTube, most of you will go to contact and look at it. And I was, the Lord was asked, uh, give me a word to share how we ought to conduct ourselves in the face of this uh, COVID-19 uh, as Christians, you know, and he asked me to speak to uh, every believer, wherever you are. And we came from the book of Proverbs, where Proverbs says that don't rejoice when your enemy falls or stumbles. And today we find how even in the, midst, in the face of a deadly disease like this, Politicians are using it to accuse and try wishing that somebody, vis-a-vis -vis the president, caught 
the COVID idea and die. And these are people who profess to be Christians. And that is why it is important that we as Christians are set apart. He sets apart. He's, the Lord has set us apart. That all that we as believers do is to pray for. We pray for and we pray that everybody will be alive. Hallelujah. Amen. We are sanctified. We are set apart. We are, we are taken away from the systems of this world. Set apart unto holiness, unto righteousness, unto godliness, unto the fear of God. We are set apart. Then we are set apart is a sanctification of the spirit unto one. What? Obedience. We are a people who are supposed to obey the word of God to the hill. To obey the word of God. We don't question what the word of God says. When the word of God says, do this, this is what we do. A people who are sanctified, we don't protest or we don't question. We just say, God, if this is your will, give me the grace to do it. That's what we do. As sanctified, people are set apart. I hear people say, I'm saved, sanctified, fill the Holy Ghost, and, and still they are breaking marriages, walking away from their wives, walking away from their husband, and still say, We are I'm saved, filled, sanctified, fill the Holy Ghost. How can you be obedient to the word of God when you are doing all those things? Lying, fornicating, and doing the things that God hates. And we say we are sanctified. No, we have been sanctified, set apart unto holiness. We are peculiar people. We are a peculiar people. Say we are. Uh, it said we are sanctified of the spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. You see what a process that we are, we go through. First, we are elected according to the foreknowledge of God. Then we are set apart unto obedience, and then we are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at all that process. The Holy Spirit setting us apart. So that when you and I go and do something that is contrary to the will of God, you know what you are doing? You and I are saying that, look, this is exactly what I have been set apart to do. Vis-a-vis -vis if you are found to be lying, deceiving, full of malice, hatred, bitterness, rancor, and all those things that the Bible talks about in the book of Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, then you are lying to the truth and you are making God a liar. You know, then Peter continues, he says, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Grace unto you. Now, I want, if you are there, open the Bible to the book of Titus, chapter 2, so we can find what grace means. Grace, Titus, chapter 2. If you have opened, quickly open, and I want one of you to read for me. Titus, chapter 2, and start from verse, verse 6. Titus chapter 2. Are you there? The book of Titus chapter 2. <coughs> Read it for me louder. Two verse 6. Young men, likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. The grace of God has appeared unto all men, and then tell us what is the meaning of grace teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly good you see what grace does in the grace of god teaches us to abstain what from what worldly lust and, worldly lust and ungodliness grace teaches us to move away from those things so when people use grace as an excuse to do evil we have a problem today we have teachers, ministers of the gospel that going around talking about grace, grace, a different kind of grace. But grace, the true grace from God teaches us to abstain from all ungodliness. Continue to read it, please. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Mm -hmm. Continue. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Continue. who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity mm -hmm. and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Wow. 
zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. See what Paul was wrote to Timothy to uh, Titus to do, grace. So when he says grace unto you, he's also saying that that grace, that thing that keeps you from sin, that causes you to abstain from all sin. When we say grace and peace, we are saying that we wish you that grace that will keep you from all what sin, abstaining from sin, abstaining from evil, the grace of God, Jesus Christ, that grace that has caused, brought us from sin to cause unto himself as a peculiar people. So it is important that we read it, and I want you or wherever as you are there, read again, read on the book of Titus chapter 8, so you can see the full meaning of grace. So when we say grace and peace, that is what we mean. Grace, that, 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 that power, that Holy Spirit power that enables you and I to say no to sin, to purify ourselves even as Christ is pure. So this is what they, uh, uh, Peter is, was wishing, is wishing to all saints. Then it comes to verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are in a week or the month where we call about Easter. We say that's the month that Jesus Christ died. Easter. So this is the period. Just this past Sunday, they talk about Palm Sunday, and that is what the world celebrates. And it goes from it, 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 uh, the, day, the date dif uh, difference uh, uh, changes what, from, from country to country or from continent to continent. But what is it about Easter? What is it about this time when we talk about Jesus Christ's uh, death and resurrection? It is the period when we receive that grace that delivered us from sin. So when he says that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we rejoice at the very fact that Jesus Christ came and died to set us free from the power of sin. He didn't come to deliver us to live in sin, but he came to deliver us from sin. He says, which, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, the mercies of God so abundant, and according to that mercy, he has begotten us, you and I, who once were bound by Satan, bound in sin. The coming of Jesus Christ has brought us, we have been begotten again. He said we have been begotten again because once we were created, when God formed man and woman, he formed us out of the son, Adam and Eve. That was the first begotten. He brought us. He created us in his own image and we fell into sin so this is when you give your life to God through Jesus Christ it's a second because he has begotten us again that's what Peter is saying he has begotten us again unto a lively hope what is that lively hope Jesus Christ is that lively hope eternal life by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead so when Jesus Christ died all we all thought all hope was lost but when he rose again from the dead, that is a lively hope that when we die, we shall also rise up again. That brings the promise that Jesus Christ made for us into full view and makes us see how it is that let not your heart be troubled for I go to prepare a place for you. That is John chapter 14. Let, it said, let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. So now that he, he rose from the dead, there is a lively hope that we have a, a true inheritance. He said he has resurrected us, uh, begotten us unto an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that face not away, reserved in heaven for you. L let's think, l let's focus on this a, a little bit. Why is it that so many of us are afraid of death? And that's the question that really bugs my mind. So many of us are afraid of death, even those who call ourselves Christians. I thank God, but Paul, he settled it while he was alive. He said, for me to live is Christ, to die is what? Gain. Gain. So many of us, we love the world so much that we are afraid to die. Yes, we want to go to heaven. But look at the hope that he has put here for us, verse 4. He says, we have been begotten unto an inheritance that is incorruptible, and it is undefiled, 
and that fades not away, and it has been reserved for you and I in a place called where? Heaven. Reserved in heaven for you. So for you and I, if we leave this earth today, there is an inheritance that has been reserved for us. That is what we rejoice in. That is what we rejoice in. That is what our focus should be. But too often our focus is earthly. That is why so many of us are devoid of praises. We don't sing songs of praises. When we sing, we are singing something that is, that is uh, out of our, our, our frustration, but not something that is sung out of hope, the hope that we have, the inheritance. Because he said we have been saved unto an inheritance that has been reserved for us in heaven. Look at around us. COVID-19 has sent so many people hunkering. Christians are living in fear. So many of us are living in fear. So many of us. We are afraid because we don't want to die. No, no, I'm not saying going to commit suicide. I'm not saying that. But I'm also saying that if we quote the scriptures, we have to make sure that we believe it. Because God has not given you and I the spirit of fear, but the spirit of sonship. Sonship to what? There is an inheritance. So that if even in my hiding place, that covert that I go to hide myself in, COVID-19 finds me and I am gone, I know that I am not going to a place for eternal torment. There is a place reserved for me in heaven. So we that's what Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say what? Rejoice. rejoice. Christians <laughs> will rejoice because there is an inheritance for us. The world doesn't know that. That is that why the world is always crumbling for the material things of this world, trampling people underfoot. My beloved, when you hear, if, when you open your, the news and see somebody, I mean, saying that you, 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 I wish you die. Mm -hmm. And people are wishing to use fellow human beings as guinea pigs. You know, I was, the Lord gave me that message two days ago when I was talking about collateral. Once upon a time, when we use the word collateral, we mean build and structure, inanimate object, collateral. Suddenly, now humans are being referred to as collateral objects. The words, once you begin to talk of a human in terms of collateral object, it means that you are not even, you, 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 your empathy and uh, sympathy is not there. You can easily go and kill a fellow human being and just say that they are what? Collateral. So hence you have war, declaration, whether it be biological warfare, whatever thing that we do, we, do, we don't care. As long as we can eliminate people we don't want, we don't care. We call them collateral objects. Collateral objects. But if you and I happen to be among those people who are labeled collateral objects, let the world do so. Because in heaven, you are not a collateral object. In heaven, there is an inheritance for you. Inherit, in heaven, you have an inheritance right in the presence of God. That is why it is important that during these difficult times called COVID-19 period, you and I are making sure that we strengthen our grip on the Lord. Because look at it, verse 4. We have been begotten unto an inheritance that is what? Incorruptible. This world inheritance is corruptible. The inheritance of this world are incorruptible. They are corruptible. Stock market is going down. The value of people's home getting at the, I mean, people even at this point don't even see any value, any worth to whatever they have. Because they don't know whether tomorrow they will lie, they will leave. The things of this world are corruptible. They are, they are temporary, they are corruptible. But you and I have been begotten unto an inheritance that is incorruptible. It is reserved to us in heaven. Heaven is real, my beloved. It's not a pigment of imagination. All nations, evangelical church members, a United Calvary members, church members, all over the world, wherever you are, heaven is real. Heaven is real. It's not a pigment of imagination. So if we have been begotten unto an inheritance that is incorruptible, that should always occupy our, our hearts and minds and cause us to rejoice every second. As Paul says, rejoice in the Lord again, and I say rejoice. He said, we are kept. He said, who are kept by the power of God? You and I are kept by the power of God. Verse 5, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Did you hear that? We have been kept by the power of your Holy Spirit. When you move to the book of Ephesians, I believe chapter 1, verse 13, 
It says that when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he sealed us with the Holy Ghost of promise, which is the guarantee of the purchase possession. When you and I believe, the day we believe and receive Jesus Christ into our hearts, we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise as the guarantee of our purchase that God has bought us. We belong to him. But there is a salvation that is to be revealed at the end. That is why Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew chapter 24, it says that uh, in, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many for Christ will grow cold. But those who will endure unto the end, you see that? Those who endure unto the end, those who endure unto what? The, the end. end, they shall be saved. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are kept by the power of the Holy Spirit. But one thing we have to know, the Holy Spirit of God will not strive with us. He will not strive. He is not, as they use the people of this politicians to use dictator. The Holy Ghost is not a dictator. He will not, he will not try to force you against your will. If you choose to walk away, he will fight with you. No. But he has been charged with the responsibility of keeping you and I until that day of the uh, uh, that day of uh, salvation. Let me read it again. It says, "Who we are kept by the power of God through faith unto what salvation, salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time when Jesus Christ will break through the clouds and will come with the trumpet sound and come and take those of us who have." kept ourselves faithful unto him he will come and take us unto himself that is the final salvation and so it is important that you and I make sure that we are walking in lockstep with God remember the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 14 it says that as many as are led by the Holy Spirit of God they are the sons of God so it is your responsibility and my responsibility to abide in him abide in him walk in him by faith listen to the holy spirit and follow the holy spirit's leading and dictates because the holy spirit of god will not lead you into sin he will lead you and i away from sin that is part of the package of grace grace the grace of god that teaches to abstain from sin now it says wherein you greatly rejoice though now for a season look at verse six though now for a season if need be you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Beloved, you see that when you and I become Christians, that doesn't mean that everything is going to be rosy. No, there will be trials. There will be fact, that is when the trials and the temptations will increase. You know why? Because when you were in the world, sin was your, 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 I mean, your, your favorite thing. You loved it. You don't, you don't question it suddenly you have been delivered from sin and now that sin comes against you the same things that you were enjoying now will come against you like a, a temptation and it becomes strange to you don't 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 let anyone tell you that once you are you, you are saved you are safe no satan will come at, at, against you there will be trials the trials will abound the trials will abound there will be temptations severe one of course you'll be hated People will come at you, they will attack your very personality. But it's all part of the package. In the book of uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29, it says, For unto you we have not been only called to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. First Peter chapter 4 also talks about the trial that we will we'll go through. That even your friends would will, 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 will abandon you, can't you look at you. Uh, funny because you don't go to the party that you go with them you don't drink with them anymore they dance and the wild or you don't go but say don't let that discourage you because all those are great trials and that's what peter is talking about here he says wherein you greatly rejoice though now you for a season when the holy spirit of god comes into your heart there is a joy there is a peace that comes but in the midst of all that there's going to be trials he said, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. We are in, in a serious trying time now. People are asking, God, where are you? God, where are you? 
COVID-19 has imprisoned us. God, what are you? No, no, God is not far away. He is here. Is he aware of what is going on? Yes, he is aware of it. Why is he not acting? He is acting. But you and I have to put our trust in him. You and I have to know that our God is well able to keep you and I safe. That's why he opened us. That there's an inheritance that has been reserved for you and I. Okay? Whether life or death, we know that this place is not our home. And so Paul says that for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So you and I have to live our life like that. For me to live is Christ. Every day that I live is to please Christ and to do the will of God. If I should die, it is gain because I go to my place that has been reserved for me. It says that the trial of your faith, I love that. It says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. This COVID-19 thing is a great te temptation. It's a temptation. It's a testing of our faith. It says that the trial of your faith, now your faith is on trial. My faith is on trial. The trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. My beloved, your faith is so precious to God. It has to be tried. Your faith is so precious to God, and it, is, it should be precious to you too. But it is more precious than gold. That's what God is saying here. He says that the trial of our faith, your faith and my faith, that's why our faith has to be tried. It has to be tried. Yeah, our faith it has to be tried because it is much more precious than gold. That perishes. Gold perishes. Though it be tried with what? Fire. Do you think it is, it is one, it's a joy not seeing your faces? It is not quite because like Paul said, I yearn to see your faces, and I desire, I yearn to see every one of you. I, I yearn to see all of you. But for now, for now, for this moment, it's a trying time. And we will come out purified, like gold, vibrant, ready to work the works of God, my beloved. So take heart. Let us rejoice in the Lord again, as the word of God says. Let us rejoice. You see, your faith is so precious than gold that after you have been tried with fire, you might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Beloved, your faith, when it is tried, it is tried so that on that day when Christ shall come, you and I with rapturous joy, with rapturous joy, will be found praising God because we will say, wow, it was worth it all. It was worth it. All. It was worth it all. We don't want a, a situation where when Christ comes and here we are, we are left. And we, we, we find ourselves crying and gnashing our teeth and saying, had we known, had we known it has all, would always be at the end. But we want to be amongst the people who we will be with great joy, receive the Lord with great rejoicing on that day when he comes. Now it says, verse 8, whom have we not seen? We have not seen Jesus with our naked eyes. Yet still we love him, in whom though now you see him not, yet you do what? Believe. You rejoice. Believe in you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Is that true? Are we rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory? Peter is looking at himself, the joy that he had. And he's, he's picturing the others who he's writing to all of us. Because that is the state that every one of us who have trusted the Lord should be in. We should be a people that are full of joy, who rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We, are, we should be a people. If you have been born again, if you have, you have Christ living in your heart, you should be always full of joy, rejoicing with joy unspeakable. Our joy should be unspeakable joy and full of what? glory. Even in the midst of coronavirus, we have to rejoice. We have to be full of joy. Yesterday, as I was walking the street, this man, who by the grace of God, I prayed for one, uh, one, one day, he had a leg, his leg, the serious, I was having serious problem with his leg, couldn't walk, you know. And I thought, I guess we just prayed for him and that was it. But this man has been healed since then. And every, every day when he, he sees me, 
he's talking about it. Yesterday he was, I mean, he said, I've, to I've told my whole church, I've told my sons, I've told my everybody. I mean, he didn't have to tell me that. But he was full of joy, unspeakable. Why? Because of God, what God has done for him. He asked me a question. I said, he said, did, has anybody told you that I love you? He said, did anybody told, tell me yesterday? I, it was yesterday. He said, did anybody to, tell me before, a day before? I said, nobody told me, but only Jesus Christ. He said, well, know that, that I am here. I am full of love for you and my whole family, the whole church, because I've told them all about what God used you to do for me. My beloved, we are supposed to be, and that thing filled my heart with joy, that joy, so just, the, the joy in knowing that Christ is still in the healing world, business, that Jesus Christ will do that for this man, and for this man to be full of that joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. My beloved, we are to joy. And the, 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 the same man, every morning when I'm walking, I mean, when I, when I see her, I'll be waving and full of laughter, waving, and he said, you don't know how your, the laughter, I mean, the joy on your face do that to my heart. That's the man. And he's not the only person. So many people driving, you know, so now even they are the ones who toot their horns. When they see me, even they'll be coming from behind me, as soon as they see me, they'll blow their horns and wave because they just want that smile and they'll wave. Because that joy is one that is uncontrollable, full of joy, unspeakable, joy unspeakable and full of glory. Why? Because this place is not our home. Heaven is what? Our home. My beloved, heaven is our home. COVID-19 or not, heaven is our home. So we don't want COVID-19 to deprive us of our joy. Are you all there? Hallelujah. Are you all there with me? Don't let COVID-19 deprive you of your joy. And don't let your television set, those news reporters who have all those kind of uh, doomsday things. They don't know Christ. They don't know Jesus Christ. Don't let them be your source of, of news. Please, my beloved, I beg you, shut them off. Don't let them be your source of news. They have nothing. These are people who are full of rebellion. The Bible says that rebellion is witchcraft. And if you are listening to them with all the news items that they give to you, they deprive you of your joy and you begin to be afraid. Don't do that. Don't do that at all. Hallelujah. Are you all there with me? Yes. Amen. It says, whom having not seen, you love. When we have not seen Jesus Christ, we love him. In whom though now you see him not, yet you believe in, you, are, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your soul. You see what, how that work is, works? When you are full of joy, rejoicing in the Lord, you don't see him, yet you believe in him. You've not seen him. You believe and because of that faith you have in him, you are full of joy, unspeakable, that is full of glory. And that, that inures to your receiving. What is the end of your faith? Even the salvation of your souls and my soul. That salvation that is yet to be revealed when Christ comes. It is your joy that is become is your strength every day. The joy of the Lord is what? My strength every day. The joy of the Lord. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired. Did you see hear that? The prophets of old. Do you, look, look, look at what he's saying. The prophets. You know, let's talk about the prophets now. You have Samuel, you have Moses, you have Joshua, you have Elijah, you have Jeremiah, you have Micaiah. You have Hosea, you have uh, Malachi, all these prophets, he says, of which salvation, all these prophets, they have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that shall come unto you. They desire to know what it is inside. But listen to what was told, was told them. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Jesus Christ and the glory that should follow. If you read the book of Isaiah 53, you see talking about the sufferings of Jesus Christ and the things that will, will follow. It is there. It says, unto whom it was revealed, it was revealed to the prophets, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister. Did you see that the prophets, Elijah, Elisha, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, all these prophets, they spoke concerning Jesus' death, but it was told them that it was not unto them, 
the wherefore it says it was to them that it was not unto them but unto us unto us those of us <laughs> that have preached the gospel unto you we it says unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things unto us unto us you see how special and how precious you are to God my beloved you and I that God had to send these prophets of course they were false ones who were trying to mess up the way it went there but the true prophets were all pointing to one person Jesus Christ and the salvation that has been prepared for you and I so when they were seeking to know God said no not you it is for us wow it is for us it's something to fill our hearts with joy it says which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven with things the angels desire to look into when the prophet spoke and prophesied about the birth of Christ Christ came and then when Christ ascended who, who took over the Apostles and they also preached and they've left us this message the, the Apostles they proclaimed the word of course in the days of the Apostles they were false apostles, apostles and false teachers just as they were false, false prophets uh, during the time of the prophets but in the midst of all this God was able to preserve the true ones and the true ones have left us this message of hope so what is he telling us to do now the wherefore my beloved where you see wherefore you have to see that is a wherefore is begin to tell you the the, the, the the need the need for you and I to take a good care of ourselves is a wherefore get up the loins of your mind get up tighten the loins of your mind get up strengthen the loins of your mind wherefore get up the loins of your mind be sober and hope to the end my beloved do you see that why should he tell us we to hope unto the end if there is something known as once saved always saved eternal security i cannot stress this enough because this is what so many have been told to cause them to relax their faith and to live carelessly thinking that by i mean they, 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 they are going to heaven automatically as long as they put their names in the register in the register in heaven you just put your name in the register in heaven and then go and live anyhow no 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 they say well forget up the loins of your mind be sober and hope to the end we are to hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you see that? When Jesus shall appear from heaven to come and take us home, there is that final grace of salvation, that final one. So we are to hope unto the end. We are to hope unto the end, my beloved. Hope unto the end. Let me hear all you all say, hope, hope unto, unto the, the end. end. I can hear you, hope, hope unto, unto the, the end. end. I can hear you. Hope, hope to the, the end. end. We are to hope to the end. Amen. Amen. Say, wherefore, get up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Be sober. Calm minded. Calm hearted. Be sober. Be temperate. He said, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ shall come. And then he uses a word here, which I want everyone to look at very carefully. As is it as obedient underline that word as obedient children and so that should cause you and i to pause a little bit and ask ourselves are we truly obedient are we truly obedient because it says as obedient children not fashioning ourselves according to the former lust in our ignorance not fashioning ourselves not going back to our former lifestyle when you look today among so many of us who call ourselves christians you cannot tell the difference between us and the unbelievers because we are following so much the passions of the world people who claim to be christians and yet when you look at them you don't see a difference between us and the unbelievers we don't see our dressing doesn't show the way we talk doesn't show Everything about us even is worse than the unbelievers. But here he's saying that we ought not to fashion ourselves 
according to our former lifestyle. Because you see, you cannot become a Christian until you have been delivered from some something. Because nobody was born a Christian. Hallelujah. The only people I know were born Christians. Uh, I won't call their name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Nobody was born a Christian. We were all born in sin. And at a point that I'm Jesus Christ, when we came to us our, our, ourselves, the word of God was preached to us or something. Somebody witnessed to us. And we, 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 we surrendered our lives to God through Jesus Christ. We repented and turned from our wicked ways. We are, we are all saved from something. And because we are saved from something, we have a testimony. We can always stand and say, once upon a time, I was this, I was that, I was that, and the Lord saved me. That is our testimony. That is what we use to witness to um, other people, unbelievers. We are to witness. That's why Jesus Christ says that go and preach, go and preach, go and testify, be a witness. Every one of us should be an evangelist telling other people about Christ. But it has to begin with you. What were you in? What were you in that the Lord brought you out of that you can say, this is what the, I used to be and the Lord has delivered me from that. I don't do it anymore and this is how I am now. That will give hope and courage to the person that you are witnessing to, to know that yes, if Jesus Christ has changed you, he will change me also. That is our testimony. Too often everybody wants to preach and you want to preach but you are still carrying a baggage with you. You know, you are carrying a baggage with you. That's why Jesus Christ spoke in the book of Matthew chapter 7. Judge not. Because you are living in sin and you are trying to preach to other people. It doesn't work. You have to remove the log from your eyes so you can see the speck in the eyes of the other people. So we have to, just as obedient, verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning ourselves according to the former lust in our ignorance. When we were in sin, before we came to know Christ, we were living in ignorance. We didn't know what we were doing. Then suddenly, our eyes were popped open to see that what we were was not good. And then we repented. And so now that you have come to know Christ, we don't need to go back to that old lifestyle. We don't need to go back to the old lifestyle. You remember, when, you, when we have to note that becoming a Christian is a drastic it's a drastic, it's a drastic change. It's not one that you just uh, transit suddenly from one. Uh, uh, you, you just cross carpet. It's not a cross carpeting thing, like you talk every at the end of the year crossover, crossover. You don't cross over in Christianity. You are transformed. There's a change. Ezekiel chapter 36. It says, "When you call upon me, I will answer you. I will sprinkle you with pure water. I will take." your stony heart. You see, there's a, there's a surgery even going on. A surgical removal, spiritual surgery. Is I'll take your stony heart, I'll remove it, and then I'll give you a new heart. And I'll put my spirit in you. Heretofore, the spirit in you was a spirit that is corrupted. But the Lord said, you will take the stony heart out of you, that stubborn heart, that rebellious heart, that disobedient heart, you will take it out. And then we'll give you a new heart of flesh. A heart that is very pliant, that is pliant towards the perfect will of God. Then you put his spirit in you. And when he puts his spirit in you, he will cause you and I to walk in his way. And then when we begin to do that, then we'll look back on our former life and we'll hate it with a perpetual hatred. You see what it means? It's not just cross carpeting it's not crossing over no 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 no. it's a transformation of our lives to the extent that when you look at your former lifestyle you hate it if as of now you claim to be a christian you don't hate your former life my friend you've not you've just crossed over you've not, there are so many crossovers in the in the kingdom of god crossover gospel writers people who used to sing r and b suddenly they found out that i'm in Christ, the christians buy a, a lot of album and because they have wonderful voice they will just cross over, start singing gospel songs and say, so they can sell more songs. That's what it is. That's crossover. You are cross carpeting. Then Hollywood stars, because of their fame, suddenly cross over and say they are evangelists. And because of their name, you know, people just follow them. That's not how Christianity, true Christianity, you are transformed. There's a transformation. 
so that you hate your former lifestyle. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 15, it says, But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. You see, we have to be holy in every aspect of our lives. My beloved, it, we have to. It's a command. There is no if or but. It's a command. We have to be holy in every aspect of our lifestyle. We have to be holy. We have to be righteous. Uh, again, when you go to listen to my, the YouTube presentation today, as I opened the message, I was, I was recognizing the father. I said, look, do, belonging to the, the different parties, you have Democratic Party, you have Republican, Republican, Republican Party, all of them have Christians. I have people in, among them that are claiming to be Christians. And I was telling the Christians among them that, look, you are, you are there to be a light. You are in there, whether you are Republican or you are Democrat, you are there to be a light, to let them know what is wrong from right. But if you are found to be going along, approving things that are unholy and abominable, vis-a-vis -vis abortion, homosexuality, all these wicked acts, and you are there claiming to be a Christian and doing it, my friend, then you have just crossed over. You have not been born again. You have not been transformed. Because the people who have been transformed hate what God hates. People who have been transformed hate what God hates. And let me hear you saying that people who have been transformed Hate, hate what, what God, God hates. hates. Hallelujah. It said, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am what? Holy. Be ye holy. It's a command. God says, we who have been born again, we who have been born again, we who have been born again, who claim that we know him, we have to be holy because God is holy. Holiness. And what is holiness? Is holiness just wearing white robes, white long frolic gam some garments, and with all kind of crosses around your neck, wearing a, 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 a tall something on your head, and all walking down the street? And that, that's not holiness. No, that's not holiness. Just wearing a white garment doesn't make you holy. Wearing a white garment doesn't make you what? Holy. holy. It doesn't. Holiness is of the heart. And when you are holy inside, it will show on the what? Outside. Holiness, your speech. Your speech. The Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. There is a fruit that we bear that shows that we are holy. And we cannot become holy on our own. We become holy when Christ comes to live inside of us. We become holy when the Holy Spirit of God gains control over our lives, that we submit uh, uh, everything to the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God. Bible says, as many as are led by the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8, verse 14, as many as are led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, the name himself, the name alone shows that he's holy. The Holy Spirit of God leads you and I in holiness. Hallelujah. Amen. The Holy Spirit of God leads us in what? Holiness. holiness. The Holy Spirit will not tell you to go and clap your hands for homosexuality, clap your hands for lesbianism, clap your hands. It will not, it will not take Pastor Pimpon to go and marry a man and a man, a woman and a man, a woman, a woman, a woman, man and man. That's not holiness. The Holy Spirit of God will not allow me to do that. He will not allow me to encourage a young girl to go and abort a baby. The Holy Spirit of God will not encourage, ask me to tell you, encourage tell me to go tell you to go and commit fornication and adultery holy spirit will not do that the holy spirit of god lead us in the things that god loves holy things so god says be you holy for i am holy my beloved is a command it is not an option if you are a christian you and i have to be holy because god is holy verse 17 it says and if you call on the father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work. My beloved, let's pay attention to that place. Because your work and my work will be judged. Your work and my work will be judged. The motives, our motives will be judged. Our motives will be judged. So many people, oh, I want to become a, <laughs> I want to, I am a prophet. I want to be a prophet. I am a prophet. I am a this. I'm a, our motives will be judged. Why do you wonder? Is it for faith? Is it for making money? Why? Besides, 
<laughs> I'll preach a message on that one of these days that God, the Lord has given to me. Our motives to be judged. It says, and if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here with, underline that word, with what? Fear. Fear. Pass your time of sojourning, your days of listening here with fear, with reverence, with, with, with fear. Why? Why? For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, of Jesus Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in this last time for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory and your faith, that your faith and hope might be in God. Why? You see, why did he talk about all this? He's saying that because you and I, the reason why we have to pass our sojourning here in fear is because we have been bought with an incorruptible substance, something, and that incorruptible thing is called the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ. We have been bought with that blood. It cost God the blood of his dear son. This week, we are celebrating what we call Easter. I don't think, I don't know how many of us think about how that blood was still. The pain that Jesus Christ had to endure. The pain, the pain, the pain, the pain, the pain, the pain. When he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That pain, that God man hanging on that cross after having been whipped 40 lashes except save one on his back, on his face, on every part of his body. Flesh torn off his body. Flesh torn off. Pierced with nails in his palm. Pierced with spear on his side because the people didn't think he was really dead. So they had to pierce him to see if he was dead. Blood and water gushing out. What he had to endure to release that blood so that you and I will be cleansed and washed from sin. If we claim to be Christians, he says, pass your journey here on earth with fear, with reverential fear, with fear and trembling. So we don't have to take sin lightly. Sin is your enemy. Sin is my enemy. And you and I, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, say we have not resisted to the point of shedding blood yet in our fight against sin. Sin is your enemy. Sin in my, is my enemy. Coronavirus is not your sin, your enemy. Your enemy is sin, and my enemy is sin. There is a virus that is more potent than coronavirus. It is called sin. Sin is the worst enemy. Because when you die in sin, eternal destiny in hell is where you go to. That's why sin is your arch enemy and my arch enemy. But so many of us, we don't fear sin. We open our mouths and lie. And all the things that we do, and we, we are not afraid of sin. Why? Because nobody has told us that. No, well, they've told us, but we've become immune to it. We are afraid of coronavirus, but we are not afraid of sin. My beloved, sin is more dangerous than coronavirus. Hallelujah. Sin is more dangerous than coronavirus. You go to Iran, watch the women. They cover their faces so that the women, will, the men will not look at them and lust at them, covet to, to, to covet after them. They cover their faces. That is their attempt to, 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 to make sure that there is no adultery and lasting and this is going on. So they cover their faces. We, we scream at them and we say, oh, this is, this is primitive. But that is how they try to protect themselves against fornication, against all these things that we glory. We will go to you go to the beaches and you see a woman uh, over there, uh, her, I mean, partially naked with men around and for us, that is what we do. We go to this, what do you call it, um, Miss Queen, what do you call that, where they make the Miss, Miss World and that kind of... Oh, pa pageant? Eh? Beauty pageant. The beauty pageant. And you see the women dressed so scantily, exposing their whole body. You know, I mean, we, 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 we just swim in last we swim 
We, we see him in last. We see him in conviction. We see him in all those things. And here he's telling us. Peter is telling us here. Who oh, verily. He told us that this, that blood, that blood that was spilled for us is so precious that we have to make sure that we protect, we guard against it with the fear of God. The fear of God. We shall pass our time here with fear. Sin is our enemy, my beloved. Sin is our enemy. Our arch enemy is sin. Because when sin gets hold of you and sin finishes with you, it will send you to eternal hell. That's what sin will do. Coronavirus will not tell, they send you to hell. It can't. It has no power beyond to here. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Your enemy is sin. My beloved, your enemy and my enemy is what? Sin. Can I hear you all? Sin. Our enemy is sin. That is what we have to fear. Fear sin. But you see how our media, our media promotes sin. Our media loves sin. They promote sin. They put people of abominable character in front of you. And they are the ones who give you counsel from morning to evening. And eventually you get used to their lifestyle and you begin to accept it as a norm. That's what we do. That's how we are doing. We have become so, uh, so what do you call it? Um, uh, oh. Jaded. Is it jaded? Um, norm to be. We have become so. Hmm? Yeah, other immune, yeah, because so immune to that which is abominable. If, immune, if, if you say immune, we have become numbed. You know, you become numbed. It's, it's like, it's okay. I can tolerate it. It's okay. I can, you know, we, 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 we say it's okay. It's part of us. No, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. Sin is sin. And sin is your enemy. Sin is my enemy. Why? Because it was because of sin that Jesus Christ suffered. He had to pay the price to redeem you and I from the power of sin. He shed his blood. He shed his blood. He literally shed his blood. Jesus Christ allowed his blood to be poured out. And that's what Paul, Peter, let me read it again. He said, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. If it was silver and gold, you can always go and get silver and gold. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your father. It was not silver and gold. It was not money that redeemed you and I. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that blood that cannot be bought with any money, no money will buy, can buy the blood of Jesus Christ. No money. That is why the Lord has instructed me. When we have crusades, open air crusades, wherever we go, money is not an issue. Even in the church, money is not an issue. I don't stress on money. Why? Because money, money, money takes wings and fly. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. You cannot buy the blood. Your salvation is not dependent on money. No one can buy you salvation. But the blood of Jesus Christ is what redeems you and I. Because of that precious blood, the Lord is saying we should pass our time here, our period here, our stay here in fear, in fear, in godly fear, reverence. That we should not trivialize with sin. We don't have to dance around sin. Our Father uh, and lead us not to do them. This is how we do. And lead us not into temptation. The temptation is right here. And you are just skirting, going around it. And you love it so much. You are trying to say, I won't touch it, but uh, I won't touch it. It's like little children in first grade who are asked to pray. And their eyes are open with their hands over, but they are looking at the thing. No. But that's how we've been doing so many of us Christians. You know, we dance around it. We know it is sin. We know that sin lurking around, when it gets hold of you, it will kill you. Hallelujah. Sin will kill you. Now, he says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying what? The truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love, not hypocritical love. I love that word, unfeigned, because there are so many feigned loves on faces of so many of us. Pretend love. We pretend that we love, but we don't love. We know that we don't love. Have you seen a dog laughing before? There, was a, there, there used to be a commercial that it says, uh, laugh, something, smile, if you, if you wish, because it talks about the toothpaste, the kind of toothpaste or something. And so they, they had humans smiling, and then they came to a dog. The dog was uh, smiling. So many of us, that's how we are. We've a feigned laugh. 
Have you seen a, a pit bull? I'm talking about a real, real pit bull. A real vicious pit, pit, pit bull. When a vicious pit bull is laughing at you, run. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's laughing. When a vicious pit bull is smiling, my friend, don't smile back. La run. Because when the case is vicious, that's how so many of us are. You know? Um, that is what on a feigned love. Peter is saying that ours should be unfeigned. He says, look at what he says. He says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love. Let our love for one another be real, real love, real love, true love, not a feigned love. There is too much feigned love going on in the house of God. Too many feigned love, pretend love. You know what, I have, there are many who, growing up back home in Ghana, young men, many young men who I grew up with, you know, who, who by the grace of God, I had, the Lord had to use me, even in exalting and encouraging them in their walk with God. Today, most of them have become big, big guys in the area. In, for me to even get close to them, it, it's hard even to get close to them. These are people who walk with you. We are Christians. They are Christians. You know, so you begin to ask, is this love that they, we claim to have for each other real? If we truly have real love, it doesn't matter where, how high we are. We can't descend. And we, we show that love. My friend, if you are too big to be approached as a believer, as a pastor, whatever your title is, then my friend, check your love. It's not a true love. Peter is saying our love should be unfeigned, unpretended. It should be real love. And real love, like the love of Jesus Christ, is what came down. I love that song. I gave my life for thee. He thy precious blood. I still. I love it. I love it. Let me. I gave my life for thee. My precious blood I shed. That thou mightest ransom my mightest ransom be and quicken from the dead I gave, I gave my life for thee what hast thou given to me then it comes verse 2, he said my father's house of light my glory circled throne, I left for every night he left, Jesus Christ left everything in heaven to come and spill his blood for you and I to come and endure that pain, the whip, 40 lashes on his back for you and I, spilled his blood, endured the cross, the pain, the nails driven through his palm, made to carry that heavy cross all the way from where he was, where, where he was beaten, all the way to Golgotha, where they hanged him. My beloved, look at all that he had to endure. He left the heavenly glory to come and redeem you. So if you and I have been redeemed by that which is uh, uh, incorruptible and we have been purified by that, there is a need for you and I to have unfeigned love. The love of Jesus Christ was unfeigned. If it was, it was pretend love, then he wasted himself. But it was a true love, a real love to redeem you and I from sin. That love the Lord wants us to extend one to another, one to another, one to another. Verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. See that you love one another with a pure heart. You see behind me this Chinese snowball. Chinese snowball is as white as you can describe white pure heart. The Lord wants your heart and my heart. The kind of love that we have to have for one another should be that pure. That pure. It's a pure love. We have to love one another with a pure heart fervently. 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 Why? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which lives and abides forever. Our love for one another should be pure. It should be pure. It should be pure because we have been born again 
by not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible seed the blood of jesus is incorruptible by the word of god which lives and abides forever hallelujah Amen. for all flesh and i love this mama georgia i want to quote this because that's your scripture mm -hmm. it says for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass the grass withereth and the flower thereof falls away you and i we are just grass oh. yeah, our glory is just grass my friend look that is why we don't have to envy anybody don't waste your time being envious of any don't be envious of anybody we are grass somebody's a trillionaire and so what somebody's a billionaire and so what somebody's a millionaire and so what my friend they may have all those things they still remain grass nobody by means of his or her wealth can change what God says he is. We are grass. We are grass, so all of us, and when we begin to see each other as grass, and we see each other as grass, we'll be humble. He says, for all flesh is as grass, everyone. The millionaire, the billionaire, whatever, whatever you live, you are grass. So the next time you see grass, be careful, be gentle with the grass. Don't step too hard on the grass because you are grass also. See grass as your neighbor. Hallelujah. We are grass. It says, <laughs> For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. And our glory is like the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falls away. The grass withereth, and the flower falls away. It fades. When you come to my house here, you see all these flowers. They look, I wish I could keep them like that throughout the year, but no. The lavender plant over there is smelling so good. I wish I could open it so you can smell it, the, fra the, the fragrance of it. Look at the, uh, what do you call it, the azalea. It was bright red a few days ago. Now it is withered. They will fall away. That is your glory and my glory. That is why we don't have the proud and arrogant. Let me bring it to a close here, verse 5, verse 25. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you and I. The word of God, it abides forever. The Lord desires for you and I to feed our souls every day, every second with the word of God because that is the only one that will last unto eternity. On that note, I say grace and peace to every one of you. I'm going to bring my Madura here and let them bring this thing to the close. Our weather, the weather is getting spread. It looks like it's going to rain. But listen, I love you all and I thank God for every one of you having spent this quality time with us. If there are new people who have joined us, uh, Sister Karen, uh, Karen, Sister Karen Sheffield, uh, and all Sister Laurie, all the new people who have come to join us today, God bless you. Thank you so much. We thank you all for this glorious time we've had this Bible study on the Word of God. Thank you God for our first Peter chapter 1. God bless you all. Grace and, and peace. We'll see you on, on Friday, on Friday evening for prayer and then Sunday, resur a resurrection day. We all come and celebrate Christ together. Amen. Make sure you join us for prayer. Prayer is so important as a Christian. Join us for prayer. We have all the time in the world now to <laughs> pray and to study the word of God. Amen. Amen.